So good evening all. Uh, uh, I'm glad to see all of you here and thanks for joining us today uh, on this call. Um, so the topic we are discussing is our journey uh, with Datastax uh, and Cassandra uh, over last six or seven years. Uh, and also some, uh, we didn't just want to leave it high level, some tips for uh, users who are actively uh, using Cassandra in their own environment, uh, especially with focus on the recent Datastax Astra uh, deployment. So uh, this is a team who worked on the presentation. So myself, I'm a co-founder and chief architect at Alpha Ori Technologies. Uh, we have Tim, who is the data engineering manager, and uh, Rinjit couldn't join us. So, uh, what is uh, Alpha Ori Technologies? Uh, what do we do? Uh, it's a company founded in 2017, and uh, we have about 400 plus staff, development centers in US, Singapore, uh, India. Uh, we transformed the maritime. We build uh, IoT platform for ships. Uh, we track sailing ships. Uh, we have a platform where all data from various uh, machinery on board ships is captured. So there are some servers on the ships and there are servers uh, on Amazon Cloud. So the data is collected from various machinery and we transform it, collate it, and send it to the cloud. We use this data to drive uh, various uh, solutions uh, for stakeholders, so which include uh, modules, uh, which uh, help uh, ships reduce emissions. Uh, so there are there is a big drive on decarbonization uh, because of the IMO directive <coughs> to reduce emissions and achieve net zero by 2050. So this is uh, one of the objectives we have. We also do have uh, various other modules which help things like predicting machinery fa failures or uh, alerting users uh, for, uh, you know, so we leverage AI and ML uh, to a large extent to drive a lot of our solutions. So tech stack, uh, we are on to Node.js, Java, Angular, Python, Amazon Cloud. Uh, we use Cassandra database. Uh, and recently we have moved to Astra. Data warehouse is on Snowflake. For DevOps, Azure DevOps, Observability, New Relic, and CloudWatch. That's our stack. So just a summary of what we have achieved. Uh, about 230,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide saved. Uh, 75,000 metric tons of fuel saved and $38 million uh, of revenue saved for our uh, customers. These are our products. So SmartShip, Smart Voyager, and ShipArm. So this is in summary, I just explained in brief uh, already, but there is a ship um, or shown in the diagram. There are multiple uh, ships like this. So we currently have about 450 ships using our software. So there, the software on board is accessible to the crew. They can use it. The connectivity from ship to shore is over satellite. It's particularly bad. So we have to do a store forward mechanism to make sure that the data syncs uh, correctly. Now on the ship, we collect about 3,000 to 5,000 data points every 30 seconds from various machinery. Now uh, there's a lot of challenge in the shipping space because it's a niche area, there are very little standards. So every ship is unique. The machinery itself, even though it's the same machine on uh, two ships, they follow a different format. And we had to write our own parsers to parse this data. So once the data is retrieved from the ship, uh, we, we have some parsers sitting there. We have a local database uh, for the application to run. Uh, and even when the connection, like the satellite connection is offline, and then the data is synced to the shore. And on the shore side, the, the whole data is aggregated. And so a lot of our solutions run on like the optimizations and ML algorithms on the cloud, uh, are run on the cloud, because the compute on the ship is not sufficient to perform this uh, analysis. Some of it, smaller ones, run on the ship itself. Uh, 
So why uh, did we go with Cassandra? Uh, so one of it, the main uh, aspects is performance. So we do need a high ride throughput. Uh, hundreds of vessels are sending um, roughly 5,000 data points. Uh, high read throughput, large number of concurrent users and service requests uh, from uh, even AI, uh, ML algorithms and uh, other uh, services requesting the data. Uh, Cassandra is able to handle this with ease. High availability. Uh, now, we, uh, of course, this is used by various stakeholders, including ship owners, operators, um, you know, uh, to some extent, um, uh, the uh, uh, owners, operators, and other, uh, you know, insurance providers, and few other um, uh, stakeholders who, who make use of this data. So it need to be highly available. It need to work on off-the-shelf rugged hardware. We didn't want to procure very specialized uh, hardware or um, uh, anything on the ship because it has to scale and it has to be reasonably priced. It has to scale uh, on the cloud for future. Uh, so even though uh, you would have noticed like the number 500 ships is not large, but uh, the whole uh, shipping, if you look at it, there are roughly 55,000 ships uh, of uh, commercial ships which can use a platform like this. So we already have a decent uh, market size. And so that it's, a, uh, you know, uh, considering the standardization and all that, it has, it has been a challenge to even scale up to uh, the number we are currently. So it's going up much faster at this time. <coughs> DB replica. So considering the ship and shore disconnect, uh, we had a challenge that on the ship and on the shore, we have to use the same database. Um, this also has the advantage of limiting development, or duplicate development uh, for another database to be on the ship, which is lighter. So we had to use same DB on the ship, same on the shore. Now, which other DB can be the same? It can scale. Uh, it has to be redundant on the ship. So while we need, uh, when we say redundancy, there has to be multiple nodes. And uh, for some of the other NoSQL uh, uh, databases, you need a separate leader. And the leader has to be um, highly available as well to have redundancy. So that would all increase the cost. With Cassandra, it's a masterless database. It can uh, have a minimum three uh, is what we need. And so that that's the reason uh, Cassandra suits this. Uh, cloud agnostic, we can go to any cloud in the future. Uh, it's low risk. Uh, when we started in 2017, um, Cassandra was uh, pretty much uh, accepted by leaders, uh, mature technology. So that's the reason we went with Cassandra to begin with. Our Cassandra journey, we, uh, you know, we, when we started, we had like roughly five engineers. Uh, uh, although currently we are 400, we still, our DevOps and uh, database team is pretty lean. So we hardly have uh, five engineers altogether. <clears throat> so when we started uh, one DB admin, uh, we selected uh, uh, Mongo. And uh, Mongo wouldn't work for us. We realized it pretty soon. And so, especially because of the masterless uh, requirement. And then uh, we moved to um, uh, having our own on-prem data center with Cassandra, with our custom scripting for backups and other custom uh, you know, repairs and uh, other operations were being managed by our own scripting. Of course, uh, with the open source uh, support. Um, monitoring was quite rudimentary at this time using CloudWatch. Uh, we had one product, roughly 50 vessels, a single three, like a three node cluster, uh, about 750 gigs of data. Uh, in 2020, we grew to 200 vessels, roughly 10 clusters, three to six nodes, several TBs of data. Uh, still, one DB admin, and uh, at this time we have already switched to DataStax Enterprise. The reason was we were finding it challenging to 
manage the cluster using our own scripting. There are some risks we are identified on security, uh, people doing handwritten scripts, uh, you know, keys were hard coded. Uh, scripts wouldn't sometimes work and things like that. So a lot of challenges. So we moved to DataStax Enterprise. And then 2022, uh, you know, we are already 1,600 plus vessels across different platforms, three products. So we have 20 plus DBs, and this is the time when we decided that we'll move to Astra because it's serverless, it scales according to our need. Uh, you don't need too many um, uh, hours to be spent on creating and managing the cluster, etc. So that's where we moved to Astra. Now, what were some of the challenges we faced as a new uh, user of Cassandra? Cassandra, everybody knows, is easy to, uh, is a, a very powerful database, easy to get started, but it becomes painful when you have to maintain it and when the data load increases. So we made our fair share of mistakes. Uh, the first uh, set of uh, issues we faced is a poor schema misconfiguration, performance issues leading to failed queries, um, unstable cluster, uh, cluster, you know, nodes would go down at times. We wouldn't, like if there was a heavy query coming in, it would cause a particular node to shut down. And then, uh, you know, the ops would have to look into why and, uh, you know, bring it back on and all that. But all of this was uh, impacting our business. We had random outages at times. And um, this was also partially because of our poor monitoring capability. So we did have some basic monitoring from the um, uh, open source uh, using Grafana and all that, but uh, you know it, it was still not sufficient to the extent uh, with the limited resources we had. Uh, you know this led to extended uh, resolution times. This also had business impact. Next uh, was complex operations. So when you start, when you set up a cluster for Cassandra, you don't really think about all the other uh, aspects which has to go along with it. So you have to repair the cluster. If a node is down for a certain period, you have to bring it up and repair. Um, you have to make sure that all the nodes are in uh, sync. So all of this was being done using our custom scripting. And uh, this was resulting in wasted man hours. Uh, security compliance, governance risk. Again, support, uh, community support, which is somewhat ad hoc in nature. Uh, you know, if there was an issue really which we couldn't identify, we had to go to the community and ask questions. And sometimes, um, you know, we wouldn't get a proper response or a timely response. And this also had a real business impact. So this is where we moved to DataStax Enterprise. Uh, we had a session where we decided um, to refactor our schema to a large extent with DataStax Consulting uh, support. So they uh, identified or helped us identify some of the uh, issues. Uh, they clearly understood our use case and we refactored some of the uh, major uh, blocks. And uh, that led to a healthy uh, cluster and eventually we moved into the DataStax enterprise uh, product. So um, Ops Center is a big thing which comes with uh, the data stacks enterprise tooling. And uh, that helps you do monitoring and troubleshooting as well as uh, cluster management. So setting up a new cluster, monitoring it, repairs, uh, health uh, status, alerting, all of this is taken care of by the Ops Center platform. Ad hoc support, of course, 24-7 uh, enterprise support from DataStax was extremely uh, useful for our team. So if there was an issue, they would come online on video calls and support us uh, through if there was a real hot issue happening, production outage, things like that, we would get immediate support from all different time zones, which was extremely useful. Now, recently, uh, we moved to Astra. Why? Uh, Astra from DataStax Enterprise. So one of the challenges, it says paper use, but one of the challenges we had uh, was setting up these uh, clusters uh, for uh, demo and uh, 
um, sales and uh, so these the, 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 there are a large number of clusters which are not really production grade but Cassandra itself needs a certain minimum size and resourcing to operate uh, properly and so we would have a three node cluster doing very little and we would have wasted these resources just so out of the 20 clusters maybe three or four are production uh, you know, grade the others are wasting resources just for nothing so but with Astra, you pay only for the amount of reads, writes, storage, and data transfer. So that's a big uh, uh, advantage, and we decided to go there. Rapid time to market. So setting up a cluster involves a lot of hours. Uh, even with automation, you have to make sure the cluster is healthy. Uh, you know, looking into um, best practices, security setup, certificates, everything, you know, by the time you uh, provision a cluster, test it and make sure it's uh, at least a day uh, uh, to two days spent by one or two engineers uh, before it's available. But with Astra, it's, uh, you just go in, click, type some configuration, you know, just click and it's provisioned immediately. A few minutes is all what it takes. Scalability. So uh, Astra is, uh, scales horizontally, beautifully, very fast. So you don't really care about scale anymore if your schema is optimized appropriately. Uh, there are some minor changes we had to do uh, to adapt to Astra because Astra has to, um, uh, is to be used by a larger number of users. They have to put in guardrails and uh, to avoid misuse or abuse of the system. And so that is in fact a blessing in disguise for our developers to start following the best practices which actually makes the server uh, or the, the platform stable for the future. So when we have more uh, users, more scale and more uh, uh, clients connecting and making requests, uh, all these guardrails uh, uh, help uh, our, our system. So security and compliance, so with Astra it's inbuilt, baked in, so you just follow their uh, standard practice you, you know, for, to connect and um, so there is um, uh, data is stored at rest, data is stored in transit and um, you can have your own custom key if you want. Uh, you can have VPC peering, uh, so the data never, you know, even while it's connecting, it doesn't go over public internet. It connects through a private uh, tunnel. It's cloud native, uh, so uh, you know if you look at the on-prem, it really, uh, if you connect a Cassandra cluster to a big data pipeline. Uh, or, or some other service. So you have all the other components of the pipeline which can scale. Like let's say you have Lambda, you have um, EKS, Fargate, all of that scales, but the database doesn't scale. Now this gives us the option to scale the database also. And so it's cloud native in that way. Um, you don't have to think too much about sizing the machine and uh, you know, capacity planning and uh, year over year. Uh, you know, spending time on all that. So fully managed, you don't think about a lot of uh, the aspects of manual management, repair, um, monitoring the nodes. So uh, specific issues, we get alerted by the customer support team. Um, and uh, when there is a real issue, they are on top of it uh, supporting us. So. Uh, it has been an uh, excellent decision in our view to move. We, uh, you know, we have in fact saved some uh, and also uh, made a lot of uh, uh, our resourcing available for other tasks. So what's the result and impact? Less operational overhead, no scaling worries, low latency, high throughput availability across workloads, replacing oversized clusters, with uh, serverless database, security best practices on each cluster, no variability by environment, best in class support, no more tarballs. So one uh, aspect we observed is, uh, you know, when our deployment team 
sets up the cluster. If it is a production cluster, they would have a certain standard for uh, security or for uh, you know uh, configuration. Uh, but if it's um, non-production, then they have a different take on the security needs. So all that is gone. It's all production. So uh, Astra guardrails. So it follows. It sort of. Um, so the uh, difference between Astra and some of the other managed service providers, like um, case spaces, for example, is what what we have monitored. Uh, what we have uh, noticed is that Astra is a bit more flexible to your needs. So sometimes you need X number of tables, or you need some flexibility in the guardrails itself. And DataStax team uh, have been uh, reasonably uh, flexible to accommodate those needs which are really genuine. So um, it has helped our team. Even though there are guardrails, they are not really uh, tight, uh, as in if it's really needed and it's a genuine use case, they are also flexible. Uh, innovation. So uh, over a period of time, since we started using, they have come up with different products. For example, CDC, Astro Streaming, Change Data Capture, Vector Search for RAG, et cetera. So in our case, uh, we are still uh, starting to explore the vector search in some of our internal use cases. But we are already using CDC uh, and Astro Streaming for a certain use cases. So for example, we had an application where we needed to move data to Snowflake. And so with Astro Streaming, we were able to directly connect Snowflake and move data out uh, without having any external components. So just uh, direct connect into Snowflake and some uh, little bit of code, it, it starts writing code. As soon as data comes into a table, that's available in Snowflake for you to consume. So that's uh, just our journey. And uh, so we wanted to leave you with few tips uh, for Astra, uh, some of our lessons learned, and uh, Tim will walk you through those. Thank you. Thanks, Ravine. Yes, yeah, so um, as we evolve from Open Cassandra to uh, Data Enterprise to uh, Astra, there's a few examples that we uh, came through and we learned over it. Um, our use case mostly evolve around the time series data. Um, so we have a few to share here. So from left, um, so there's a few options um, that we have tried. Um, the focus requirements of our time series is that um, we, we want to minimize the cluster resource requirements, right? Bias for the right performance. Um, we want to make our schema future-proof, right? um, flexible. Um, so with that, we, we want to you know, uh, look at the option, how we arrange the schema, the data model, to support these requirements. So the first one on the left is um, you know, like um, sensor to have name and values as a pair. Right? So the first option is that each row will have a tag name and a tag value, right? Um, so we try that. Um, the good thing about it is that when you have few attacks, right, um, it's the selection will be pretty quick, and you know, you, um, it's, it's sort of purpose. Um, when when you want, you know what tag that you want to get, right? It it gives you directly the that value. Um, because it's right there in the row. Um, the downside of it is that um, because each row has just one tag, right? we want to support 3,000, 5,000 tags for each uh, 30 seconds. So that's a lot of rights, right? And, and that's the, 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 that is not what we want. Right? Uh, another downside is that if you want to query across multi-tags, multi right, um, you have to gather all the rows for you know all these tags right so that that is not uh, optimized right uh, the next one is uh, we consider a flat model right so instead of each row have each tag we put more tags into one row right um, and then the key we arrange by group source right 
So sensor, they group, we grouping them, and source is, is another instance that belongs to that tag. Right? So when you query, you can query by source name uh, on the date that you want. So you get a row, you get back a list of tags. Right? Um, so that is a little bit better than the row. Um, each row has its tag. Right, um, it's, it's more dynamic. You can get more more various tag on on one row. But then the downside of that is that we have a lot of tags so it's very slow. So it's end up like um, a lot of columns right on the table, and and that's another downside. Yeah. Um, we try another one is collection right. Uh, instead of having a flat table, a uh, flat row, um, we we try to do like uh, map collections where you have a pair value inside. Um, you can even put index in the map. Um, and, and with that, you can, you know, instead of having, so you can overcome the wide table. Right? You have only one column where you have map and value. Um, so then you, when you query a row, you can look up by tag name. Right? Um, so the good thing is you, you don't have the wide table problem, uh, but then you have to deal with the collection, right? Um, um, so when we go and test it, um, the, the performance result of having collection, it doesn't really meet what we want, right? Um, 3,000, 5,000 uh, rise per, per 30 seconds, right? And then the last one we try, right? instead of having collection, we have a string representation of the map, right? In, it's in text. And, um, and that's, that achieved what, really what we want. It's simple. It's a, a compact structure. Um, it's future-proof. If ever you want to change the structure in, in that collection, right, uh, a string representation is free form. Right? You don't have to change the schema. Uh, one thing about Cassandra, when you, you don't want to change schema, right, you want to go back in three, and you have to fix all of that data migration. That's a lot of problem. Um, but the downside is that you know, um, with the free form JSON string, you know, you got when you read it, you gotta unpass it into JSON on the clients. Um, that's an that's a kind of downside, but but that's why you know um, uh, the client side they know what they want, they 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 know what they put in, they know what they get out, so th that's okay. Um, another downside is that. Yeah, if you want to get uh, uh, some specific, uh, specific tags out of that, it may be a challenge because you have to unpass the JSONs and and get to that, right? So, um, so why we have so we chose the last one, and here did, we did some kind of performance tests um, uh, on an option that we have. So the first one is insert for flat collections and the, the text string, right? We take about twenty tags and we test that. Um, and uh, on the right, you've got uh, the TAM that, uh, for this uh, test we have. It's come out that uh, the long text string takes only 49 milliseconds for write 20 tags. Right? On selections, um, the long text string is, uh, is the winner. It's only take 9 milliseconds to read the, that string of text. Okay. Um, Another learned uh, lesson learned we have is that um, we have some tips for improving performance um, from the traditional OpenStack to Astra. Um, with uh, the traditional Open um, traditional Cassandra, we uh, we we deal with uh, uh, the parallel queries uh, by using batch inserts, and then we have this range selection queries as you see the, the uh, example below. Um, where you want to write, um, you want to write using batch. Um, the, the, there's a limitation that we have, which Astra, um, we we don't have to deal with that. You, we can have many inserts uh, going in parallel, and let Astra dealing with scaling on that. So that worked well. Um, same thing for selections. Right? Instead of you do an int statement. You can send multiple selections. Okay, so moving on. There's some uh, tips on uh, improving cost efficiency. Um, so, um, 
Yeah, so we, we, we have an issue on, you know, we have too many reads and writes and updates. We have a, a lot of data size, right? Um, we have different approach by like doing caching. We recompile the S3 into a file, right? Um, instead of reading on the same table, repeating reads, we, we do computation and we write to S3 file. And we have an API just open that S3 file and streaming back. Um, we also done compression for last size of data. It's moving on here. Um, last one, data migration strategy. Uh, we try different approach using CDM, Spark, uh, DS4. And um, there's useful for each, there's limitation for, for, for each also. Um, okay, so for CDM, it's useful when, uh, um, when doing both the, both the time series migration. Um, it's, uh, it, you don't have to do a lot of coding configurations. It's fast, reliable um, when you do transfer data transfer. Right? But the downside of that is um, uh, we have issue. We tend to issue with table columns, uh, which use a defy type when uh, the destination key space are different. Right? Um, that's right. Uh, yeah, I think we're running out of time. Uh, we leave this on on the slide. Um, you can you can look at it, and if you have any question, we always be here.